Good evening. Welcome to the Mill Valley Library. My name is Deborah Schwartz, and I'm on the board of the Mill Valley Historical Society in charge of the First Wednesday Speaker Series, an oral history program. And I am so happy to see all of you here tonight. This is the season of appreciation for what we have and what we can give. We sit here together, comfortably settled in this lovely room in the most wonderful library. We are so fortunate to be recipients of the goodness of this place. And we at the Mill Valley Historical Society are very, very fortunate to be able to host our first Wednesday speaker series here. So we want to be sure to thank the Mill Valley Library for the use of this space. Thank you, Mill Valley Library. One of the ways we show our appreciation is at the end of the presentation today to help put the chairs back on the racks, put the furniture back in place, and help out the employees so they can get home. I'm sure they're ready to go at the end of the day. And at this time of giving, should you decide to put a little stuck, stu uh, something in the stocking, stuffer, a little gift, here or there to the Library of the Historical Society. That'd be cool, too. Here's a little bit about tonight. How many have been to a first Wednesday speaker series? Practically everybody. Well, thank you for coming back. Um, for those that haven't, our evening will go as follows. We'll have our presentation for about 50 minutes, and then we'll have about 15 minutes of Q&A. After that, we'll schmoozy schmoozy, talk with friends, see familiar faces, and help put the room back in order. But we have to be out of here. We have to be heading out the door by about 8.30. So thanks for your help. We sure appreciate help putting the place back together. And, uh, and that's our timeline. From the 1950s to the, the late 1970s, Druid Heights, a secluded artist community built mostly from scavenged materials and located down a private, rutted road near wood, Muir Woods, fostered an environment of innovation, architecture, art, poetry, philosophy, music, and from what I've gathered for the interviews I've conducted with the people that lived and have, have lived there and still live there, some amazing parties. Home to poet Elsa Gil Gidlow, freewheeling bohemian Roger Summers, philosopher and Buddhist scholar Alan Watts, poet Gary Snyder, and master furniture maker Edward Stiles and his artist wife Marilyn and their sons, and many others, Druid Heights has captured the attention of many. Do we have anyone in the audience who has lived at Druid Heights or lives there presently? Yeah. Hey, I didn't know. Huh. Well, this is a large crowd tonight. And obviously, Druid Heights has influenced or impacted or captured the attention of many for a lot of different reasons. Tonight, we're delighted to have as a guest speaker Golden Gate National Recreation Area historian Kristen Barron. Her talk is titled, Druid Heights, A Place for Makers and Doers, A National Park's Perspective. And in this presentation, she'll share some of GGNRA's efforts towards protecting this fragile site, as well as highlighting the challenges of interpreting a non-traditional resource. Kristen is an architectural historian at Golden Gate National Recreational Area, and she has worked for the National Park Service for 25 years. She's been involved in many preservation and building re rehabilitation projects, including work at the Presidio of San Francisco and Fort Baker's conversion into Cavallo Point. She has a historic preservation degree from Columbia University and enjoys interpreting the history of different built environments. She and her family live in Mill Valley, and her husband has been my doctor, so I can vouch for them all. <laughs> there you are, Ari. Anyway, let's give a very, very warm applause for our guest speaker tonight. Thank you. I don't need that. Like this. 
Thanks, you guys. Can you hear me? Is it too loud? Is it too in? Hi. Um, it, this is a new apparatus for me. I was saying to a friend, it's sort of like uh, Druid Heights meets Janet Jackson. So it's slightly different. We got the technology and we got the history. So um, Franklin will be able to take care of me. Um, so tonight, what I want to do is be uh, partly a tour guide and partly a historian. Some of the things I want to do is introduce you to the people in the community and the history of Druid Heights. I also want to share with you some of the work that we've done out there at the Park Service, uh, the work that we've done. Druid Heights was an amazing creative enclave that both created and cultivated a tremendous amount of work in poetry, religion, uh, music, philosophy, uh, but also just remind you that um, uh, this is my version. I am an architectural historian, so I read buildings, I read landscape, I am in the cultural resource division. I'm not a social historian, I'm not an anthropologist, so uh, the, the great, wild, fun stories of getting high with Judy Collins in the hot tub, I don't have. That's not my lens. And also to remind you that I wasn't there. Like in 1973, I was probably home watching the Partridge family. So a lot of you, how about a raise of hands of how many people have already visited or been part, have seen Druid Heights? There we go, okay. So um, you were all there or you have been there. Um, this is the Park Service version. It's not the only version. A lot of people here are really interested in Druid Heights from their own variety of interests and their own variety of people that draw them to it or the stories. And I can't cover all of those, but I can cover what we have. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about, I'm going to give you a digital tour. It's sort of like an armchair tour of, of uh, Druid Heights. Before we get to the pretty pictures, because I'm a parent, I like setting limits. Is that too loud? Franklin, thank you, you figure it out. Let's be clear, Druid Heights is a private site. Yes, it's part of GGNRA, but it is a private site. If you want to see a state-of-the-art brick Civil War fort, I can get you to Fort Point. If you want to get to see a 1930s penitentiary site, I can get you to Alcatraz, if you've got tickets. But what I can't get you, or what I'd really like not to get you, is to Druid Heights. We have people still living there. We have families out there. Some of those families are aging. It is, I know everybody's curious and I know everybody's interested, but the thing that trumps that interest is protecting the people who live out there. And the other issue is all those other sites that I just referred to, they're up to state and city code. They're ADA accessible. This site is not. This site is not ready and open for business. So I think we just want to remind everybody, a lot, there's a safety issue. We've got rotting decks. We've got spongy floors. We've got uh, trunks hanging off of roof beams. So I just want to be mindful, because we were so want to share this information with you, but then everyone's like, great, I want to get out there. I'm like, maybe try not to. So that, that's my little sort of notice about it. So let's start back with a little history on how this started. And the history of Druid Heights is actually very much linked to Muir Woods. So Muir Woods was established in 1904, 1905. Uh, hiking was big, and as we all know, in Mill Valley. And some very smart developers bought a whole bunch of land right around uh, Muir Woods. And they called it the Camp Mosta Vista property. It was, and they carved it up for vacation sites. And someone very, Mrs. James Ross, as a Ross back up in further north of us, she bought it thinking it was going to be a great vacation home. What she didn't factor in was the fog. So she actually never built anything up there. And when she passed, she willed it to her gardener, Alphonse Hoppe. Alphonse was a great gardener. Turns out he was also the gardener at Garden of Allah, right up here in Muir Woods, I mean in Mill Valley. He was a great gardener. He was not a good farmer. He was not a successful farmer. He built a um, couple of residential buildings, a couple of, uh, like a, a little barn and a little garage. He didn't do very well. And so by 1945, he put the property up for sale. So in comes in some of the characters that I want to share with you. Um, I'm going to refer to uh, a wide variety of people, but I can't refer to everybody. So uh, Deborah just mentioned Elsa and Roger. Elsa Gidlow and Roger Summers meet each other by the late 1950s in Berkeley at KPFA. They meet each other at uh, the Asian American Art Academy, and they both want 
a cheap and inexpensive place to work. They didn't get together and say, I know, let's put on a commune. That was not it. It was very unintentional. They just wanted an inexpensive place to get their work done. So they buy the property from Alphonse in 1953, and they move in. And we know from Elsa's bibliography, or her biography, once she walks down that road, she really feels like she's home. And she refers to it, she's the one who actually names it Druid Heights and refers to it, Druid as in knowing and wise, not the people with the divining rods. Like she, it was a special, contemplative, thoughtful place where she was gonna get her work done. So I love this picture because it's just a, a snapshot of a detail of some of the architectural elements. So this community pulls together and draws a wide variety of people. Um, but by the late 50s, all the way up to the late 70s, people come and arrive. Some people come for a day, some people come for a couple of weeks, some people move in, build a cabin, and live there for quite some time. As, as Deborah referenced, there's a lot of people that had, had come in and out there. I can't refer to all of them. I'm going to introduce the four main stakeholders, and then later you're going to see some of the NPS cultural resource tools that I use to help figure out why those, those people are so important. So Elsa Gidlow, Roger Summers, Ed and Marilyn Stiles, and Alan Watts. So these are sort of the four. I know there's, there's Gary Snyder, there's, but you'll see later why I, I reference them, but I can't quite refer to them all as much. So Elsa Gidlow. Elsa Gidlow, um, she was referred to as the mother of Druid Heights. She lived there from 1953 to her death in 1986. She was the first sort of um, California state recognized open lesbian poet, which back in the 50s was really, really quite unusual. She wrote all of her bodies of work here. So this is a lovely list of some of the things of most of her body. She did the body of her work here. And later, you'll understand why I'm saying the body of her work here as opposed to other people that pass through, maybe picked up little germs of interest, but actually did their greater work elsewhere. So Elsa um, also created this incredible energy for feminism, for political activism. She worked with Margot St. James, who was an incredible woman who worked on the activism and political rights of uh, prostitutes. They came up with this great organization called Coyote, which was uh, Call Off Your Old Tired Ethics. Um, so she was, she was vibrant and drew a lot of women and a lot of politics, a lot of power out there. So she was sort of referred to as the mother of Druid Heights. So if she was the mother, then Roger Summers was the Peter Pan of Druid Heights. Roger, by all accounts, was a big personality. He had uh, energy, and he was a builder. He was not officially trained as a builder, not an official architect, but he was creative and thoughtful and explosive, not always maybe great with the fine details, not always great with getting the roofs, completely was lined up together, which you'll see later, but he had a fantastic energy, and his charisma drew people up there. So people came up. We know people came up down that road and said, I hear there's a carpenter. You know, it was a really nice, expressive time. So people came up, spent time with him because of his personality. Then musical people came up. The Smother Brothers were there. Um, Judy Collins was there. A lot of people were there. So he kept and he had this additive quality of building. He wasn't ever happy with just one building the way it was. He kept building on and on and on and adding pieces. And as I show you more pictures, um, I'm not a woodworking specialist, so I don't know actually the machine you used to, to route all these things, but he was very innovative. A couple of buildings have these classic Roger Summers sunken dining room table pieces. A lot of his work has this creative, um, organic shape and feel to them, and that's what so many people, so many other artisans were very, very drawn to. Um, Ed and Marilyn Stiles are of this lovely family. Ed and Marilyn had heard about this area. They, too, wanted an inexpensive place to live and work and to raise their family. Ed is a, an amazing, still uh, an amazing furniture designer. Here is a studio that he bu uh, built. He, he and Roger worked for a long time in a very lovely partnership. They shared tools, they shared designs, they built a lot of the buildings out there together. Marilyn uh, taught at UC Berkeley. She is a ceramicist. Uh, Ed actually built her, her studio out there, um, and they are still living there today. And then Alan Watts. Well, I've already used Peter Pan, so what can I use for Alan Watts? Alan Watts is a household name. My mother had Alan Watts on her bookshelf. So uh, Alan Watts was one of the premier 
um, translator of Eastern philosophy to the Bay Area, to the world, uh, wrote a tremendous amount of his work, did not write most of his work out here. So later you're gonna see why that's important. Um, he, by the 50s and 60s, he came out to Druid Heights. He didn't live, he only lived there from 71 to 73. But he visited often. He and Elsa were, everyone says that we were a very unusual pair. There she is, sort of organic gardening and very thoughtful. And he was sort of all over the place. And then by the mid 60s, late 70s, there was more rituals and ceremonies and this fabulous idea of fasting for 24 hours and then taking LSD and seeing what happens. So um, Alan Watts was definitely, uh, you could see there's an awful lot of energy happening on this place. At one point it morphs from a quiet creative workplace to things got a little crazy and actually a little out of hand by the mid 70s. So um, Druid Heights started off as a quiet, organic, thoughtful working and then sort of morphed into um, more of a scene than it probably originally intended to. So now I want to give you like a photographic tour, an armchair tour of the site. So this is Elsa's house. So this is one of the original Alfonso buildings. This, this building he built in 1926, this was originally one of his residential buildings. This is one of our only two buildings that have a concrete foundation. So remember that for later, because you'll see that why that has an impact later. So Elsa's house is actually very simple. It has um, a, a deck over on the far side, but very little additive elements to it. Roger built this bookcase for her. And of course, his classic, it's never just a bookcase. It's never just a sofa. It's an integrated bookcase and sofa with electrical outlets, so it's a fabulous work. She did all her writing here, so it is still standing where she has done all her writing, which is very important to us. This is the ranch house. It was originally a ranch house. Um, again, this was a 1940s, a 1920s, 1940s Alfonso uh, ranch house when it was ranch. As you see, it doesn't look like that now. Roger Summers, um, this was sort of his most exuberant of his designs. He put on these fabulous, uh, either Sutton Who from the Celtic era or Japanese, depending on where you look at it, these fabulous, playful um, uh, rooftops. Outside it looks pretty quiet, inside it's an extravaganza. So it was originally built as a residence, was originally a ranch house. Then he converted into a residence. At some point it actually did still function as a, com a community center. So he built this whole Japanese wing. These are actually right, I don't have a clicker, I don't have a, um, Pointer. So I'm just going to gesture wildly. So they, oh yeah, you can see my picture. There we go, over there. Um, that's all rice paper. And this is elevated up, beautiful, uh, f I think, blue stone, flagstone down on the floor. There's our first sunken, our first sunken um, dining room table. There's going to be others. And then the kitchen's fairly traditional, but you see all this gorgeous woodwork that he did. And then he had fun... It's almost like Alice in Wonderland. The things that were private, he put on a big show. So look at the bathroom. Look at that bathroom. That's a bathroom to show off to. So he did all this beautiful work. This is actually the countertop is this incredible uh, butcher block pieces. This is a sunken tub, if you can imagine. Hang on, Janet's losing her piece here. There we go, Janet Jackson, there we go. Um, this is actually a sunken tub that opens up, and then this is a whole vanity. There was, there was originally mirrors and shelves in it. That's a little stool where you can actually sit. So here is this incredibly innovative location. And hang on, guys, I'm not sure, can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, here's this really innovative house and innovative innovation, and yet you still have a vanity. I kind of like that that's still, it's still the 50s, it's still the 60s. What woman doesn't need a vanity? Even though it's Margot St. James and she's champing in the rights of prostitutes. So it's a lovely combination. So Alan Watts is, uh, it wasn't, we call it the library. It was originally a building called the, for the Center of Philo Comparative Philosophy. Ed Stiles designed this building. Thank you very much. Ed Stiles designed this building based on redwood water tanks. There are no nails in this building. It's all vertical pieces. It's very hard to see. Let's see if I can use it right there and right there are two giant metal rings with clamps. It's like a clamp system. And they're pushing up together and they're holding the roof in place. It's totally cool. 
it has some maintenance issues. Um, so we've got the roof. So it was originally built as a library. He actually moved out there, as I said, by 1971, but this was his library beforehand. Then this is the inside. So um, when it was first still a library, it's all completely round and with this incredible skylight up on top. And then we have there all these bookshelves. And then he passes by 1973, and Roger turns it into a residence. And Roger can always just turn something fabulous into a residence. So what he did here, he put these closets. So those become closets, put in these chunky heaters. What you, it's a little hard to see in this picture, but those, the, the steps the, he converts the bookcases into steps. And then this is a fabulous bed loft. So he was always playing around with furniture and design. So that's, if you want to know how to turn a library into a house, that's how one way to do it. Um, and then there's these wonderful fiberglass windows at the same time. Here's another great house. This is called, it was originally called the Casa Rondo. Uh, Ed and Roger built this as a one building, a one room house. And when it was one room, again, very innovative with furniture. There's something, there's this wonderful bed feature that during the day, the kitchen's elevated, and there's this bed that during the day, you can, during at night, you pull it out as a bed and extends as a bed, and during the day, you can smush it, you can push it back up underneath the kitchen, and it becomes a couch. So it was, again, it's sort of like living on a boat. Every space has to work. Everything has to do double duty. Um, and, uh, Alan Watts lived here until 73. After he passed, Roger moved into here and built on more and more of the additions. And this also has another sunken dining room table, because what's a house without a sunken dining room table? Uh, th this is Ed and Marilyn's house, the old chicken barn. It was the old chicken barn. They say how, um, how <laughs> Alfonso Hoppe was such a, didn't really think about the success of his, his chicken, he put all the year's feed for the chicken in this one room and he didn't contain it, and the rats got to it in about 24 hours. So he's, he just didn't really think that through. This building, as I said, was originally one rectangular building. As uh, Ed and Marilyn, as their family grew, as their needs grew for space and, and ceramic space, they added and added and built, it on, built onto it, and it really illustrates Ed's wonderful and lyrical use of wood. By 1979, Ed, uh, Ed and Roger sort of had a different cultural differences, and there was just a little too much partying going on, and Ed was raising a family and needed to uh, build him some space. So he built his own workshop. It's up at the very top of the hill, and it's a beautiful workshop. He actually has an apartment over on, a little apartment on the other side, and um, gorgeous, clear story windows, and that's up at the top of the hill. And then there's a whole bunch of little fun buildings that when you, when you have to be the park service and describe them, they're a, little, they're a little challenging. So this is the meditation hut. One of the people that had come all the way up the road and stayed for 20 years was a German uh, carpenter named Detlef Kusta. And he lived there for about 20 years. And you can tell his style because he has this, and sorry, I'm an architectural historian. I talk about style, this wonderful sort of Nordic uh, shiplap design on top of the building. And then another glass worker, another designer, um, Kim Hicks, built these beautiful geodesic, geodesic domes in the back. This building originally had a tiny little bed and a little desk, and it's like a tiny little meditation hut where you can go away. Not like the area was already remote enough, but if you still needed to get away from it all, you could enjoy the meditation hut. And then, then there's a whole smattering of interesting structures out there. So this is Datelift's house. This is his little cottage. Again, you can see the little similar shiplaps, and he sort of built on and built on and built on. And then what's this? This is an Airstream cottage. You know somebody probably bought their, built their Airstream out there, decided not to, they moved on, decided to leave it there. And Roger builds this whole structure around it. So. Um, that's, a, that's a, like a wonderful example of reusing materials, reusing what you had. None of these, we have one building that actually has a, mil, a, a Marin County permit. None of these are up to state and city codes. This is sort of a kind of eclectic feeling. And as Ed says, they did, it took them a while to build the stuff. They didn't have the money for all the materials. It's not like they went up to Redwood Lumber or San Rafael Lumber and got all this stuff. The idea was to sort of play around with it, use expressions, 
see how the buildings could have, could be expressive of their interests and of their different varieties of materials. So a lot, we've got some plywood additions, we've got some things, we, we're not quite even sure what this building's final use was, but it's got all parts of different pieces together. This is actually the back of Faye's house. Um, but you can see like, oh, there was a leak there, so we gotta put on some more plywood. So there's nothing that's intentional. Well, of course it was intentional for people to live in, but there was an additive quality. There was a spontaneous quality. There was sort of an extemporaneous quality of let's see if we can make this work. Let's try this out. So let's talk for a few minutes about the challenges of some of the managing some of these buildings. So um, very few of these buildings have concrete foundations. And that might have worked in the southwest, but it's certainly not going to work here. We've got fog. We have the wind. We have the marine air. We have rats. Um, and so without a foundation, a concrete foundation is a building's little protection. It's like the rubber boots when they're trying to stay out of the rain. And if you don't have a concrete foundation, and if your wood is sitting right on a damp little mushy soil, all of that stuff comes up into your building. So we've got some very serious, we've got a lot of condition issues because we don't have a concrete foundation. Concrete's, pro Roger was probably like, that's so mainstream, that's so 50s, we're not gonna do foundations and also, to get a concrete truck, Ed just told me the other day, getting a concrete truck all the way down there was really, really challenging. So um, that's just not what, that these buildings weren't built to last. They're not Monticello, they're not Mount Vernon. They were really just, let's see if this is gonna work and maybe it will and maybe it won't. But without concrete foundations, it's a little bit challenging. So then here's another, I love this, the Alice in Wonderland. This is a bathroom. There's no privacy in this bathroom. It's out there. This is on the second floor. This is Faye's building. This is both in what we call Faye's house. Um, that's a live tree. Roger built this house around a live tree, which is fabulous until it rains because the roof is all sort of gerrymandered. It's all sort of piggledy like around that tree. Um, and what you can't see is there's a lot of rat poop and things like that. So, and this is this incredible, that, that green thing in the way back, that's actually a tub. It's a little hard to see the depth with a uh, depth in the picture. Uh, we've got a lot of ivy coming in there. So um, this creativeness, this, this playfulness, it lends itself to a little challenging in terms of construction. And then, this is a fragile site. Every time I live in Homestead Valley, every time I hear the wind and the eucalyptus, I think, oh, what's happening out there? So we've got a lot of invasive vegetation, Ve and vegetation means, you know, we got some poison ivy, we got some ticks, that's okay. But then we've also got some storm damage. So when trees come down and we can't get out there, um, we've definitely have a problem with making sure that those, those decks are okay. Can you still hear me? I feel like I just dropped off. Okay, so more set limit setting because that's what I need to do. Okay, so we haven't made any plans for the site yet. We are so busy managing th in a very, very large park in three counties. Um, we got to keep the toilets working in Stinson Beach. We got to keep making sure people in wheelchairs can get onto Alcatraz. We have a lot of things going on. In 2014, the GGNRA created a new general management plan. We updated it from the 80s. We call it the GMP. It's sort of our, our roadmap of what's going to happen in the future. The, uh, the management zone for that Muir Woods addition, which is where Druid Heights is, the whole management zone is for natural. So I'm gonna read this to you. I don't like to read from slides, but we're going to. Camino del Canyon, which is the long, long, long dirt road that goes all the way out to Druid Heights, would be converted to a trail with access by foot or light service vehicle. That means golf carts, so not road. So it's, never, it's not paved now, it's all dirt now, it's never gonna get paved. Some historic structures associated with the Bohemian community at Druid Heights would be preserved to the extent practical and consistent with limited access. So just temper, so this, we haven't done any planning, but I want you to know this, the GMPA, the GMP was all done through extensive public process, and this is what it says for the future, when we get around to the future of Druid Heights. Just reminding you also that when we do conduct planning efforts, NPS will do a lot of public reach. We look at all our decisions. We look at all the variables. We haven't done any of that yet. So um, just, just limit setting, we haven't done that yet. One of the first things we've done though, what is the significance of Druid Heights? One of the most important things we do in the cultural resources 
It's old. We're all old. Yeah. Is it significant? And that's a really important conversation we have in cultural resources. So you know when you check into your bed and breakfast, it's got that little brass plaque and it said, this building is listed on the National Register? That means something important happened there. It means either something important happened there during the time, like the first use of the cotton gin on the West Coast, or somebody important lived there. Martin Luther King was born there. Uh, Susan B. Anthony was born there. Uh, if Martin Luther King, if it's Martin Luther King's house, if it's, it's his aunt's house, and he only was visiting for Easter, that's not important. But if he was visiting his aunt's out for Easter, and he wrote the I have a dream speech, then that's important. So it isn't just location. If you're just there for two months, it's not that significant. So three levels of significance. And broad patterns of history, so something important happened there. Uh, by our, B is for somebody who's something, somebody important was there. Or C, a great grand example of architecture or engineering. So uh, the Hoover Dam is listed on the National Register. So these are the sort of things that we need to look at um, in terms of level of significance. Then there's also integrity. And again, these are now NPS tools. Just stick with me. There's not going to be a test. Don't worry. But I want you to understand how we look at it. This is, this is different than other people. How, this is how we have to look at it. So you know, OK, how can I describe integrity? You know you love your grandmother's house, and you love the kitchen, and you love the wood floors, and the slanted doors, and the leaky windows, and that's your grandmother's house, and that, that's always your grandmother's house. And then you go visit your grandmother, and she has lobbed off that kitchen and put on a brand new media room. You're like, Grandma, what'd you do to the house? That's the loss of integrity. So we need to start, we always look in the cultural resources, we always look to make sure location, feel, setting, almost like the scent and smell of a building. Does the building still look and feel like it did when it was original and when it was significant? So you have to marry integrity with one of these three associations. There's actually a fourth with archaeology, but I don't have to worry about that right now. So that is why that's really important. Then. Now, there's state, local, and national. The Presidio is a national historic landmark. Other things are of state significance, and some things are local significance. And it's not like the beauty contest. It's not like if you're state, it doesn't matter. Or it doesn't mean like you have to get all of the criteria of all those things. You only have to hit one. So I will read to you. Um, the good news is we have just gotten information that the SHPO, you all have a SHPO, I don't know if you know it. Every state has a state historic preservation officer who makes sure all the cultural resources in that state are protected. And it makes sure the public's involved and protected, makes, makes sure that the federal agency is taking care of them. So we worked really, really hard and for a long time trying to figure out if this site, we know it's old, but is it significant? And is it significant by these definitions that I put together? So. I can happily say that the SHPO has concurred that the Druid Heights is now eligible for the National Register for Historic Places. This is a big deal. We didn't even, five years ago, we weren't even, we were so strapped, we couldn't even, remember, we're the Park Service. We don't have a lot of money and a lot of personnel. We're the people that the current administration's always not happy with. So we're not, we're not like, yay, lot, we have lots of funding. We have so little people and so little funding to get all this done. So to have actually someone say, you know what, you really need to go find out if this DOE is really, we call it a DOE, determination of eligibility. So it is, the um, Druid Heights is eligible at the state level for both the development, I'm going to read it to you because it's a mouthful, alternative lifestyles as manifested in the creative work of the community and the built environment, and at the state level for Elsa Gidlow, for LGBT, uh, LGBTQ history and literature with Elsa Gidlow. At the local level, it is, it is significant for associated with philosophy and religion, and for architecture with association with Roger Summers, and at the local level, significant architecture as a distinguishable entity whose components may lack individual architectural style. That air cabin, that airstream cabin, the SHPO really pushed me on it and said, and we had a really important conversation back and forth, and I said, it's a mess. And she goes, condition is different than integrity. Integrity is really important. And that Airstream cabin, even though it's a mess, that building was built in the style and in the feel of these other buildings. So that building contributes. That building itself is not, if you put a brass plaque on that building, the building would fall down. So that's the ironic thing. 
but I wanted you to understand what the National Register determination of eligibility means to us. I have to tell you, eligibility does not mean nothing can happen to that building. Eligibility does not protect it from uh, developers, from demolition. This goes for every building in the United States. Now, if, if it's federally, if there's a dime of federal project money on this project, we're on the hook, all of us federal agencies, to do the right thing and make sure, through all our historic preservation laws, slow down and figure out what's, what are the best next steps to go through this. So eligibility isn't like, yay, it's never going to get it's never gonna fall down, or we're gonna put our insufficient, non-existent funds into it right now, it means we have recognized that it is that important. And that is a first step. That doesn't save it necessarily, but that's a really important step that we hadn't done beforehand. So now I'm gonna quickly show you some of the things that we've been doing um, out there, because we actually have been doing some things out there. They're not, they're, some of them are big, and some of them are small. So in 2014, we got a chunk of change, and the money first went through, one of our biggest problems is scotch broom. If anybody could figure out how to eradicate scotch broom. Um, as we all know from living in California, defensible space is really, really important. Um, Druid Heights is considered a very uh, challenging place in terms of fire. So we, started, we spent money on pulling the weeds, pulling the scotch broom, pulling all that stuff away from the buildings. We also have a really big rodent problem, remember? No concrete foundation, so everybody gets up inside the buildings. So they got into, we had a lovely crew out there, and they got in and they put rat proofing, they put a whole lot of wire, me, uh, wire meshing all throughout the area. So we did that in 2014. The problem is, the stuff all grows back. So that's, you know, you can only do as much as you can do with the money you have. This is something else that we did. Um, er, again, every time I hear that wind going, I'm like, oh, what's gonna happen to those buildings? So what we did is we also got money for something called HABS, Historic American Building Survey. This program was actually created by J, uh, JFK, by FDR, as a Works Progress Administration to try to keep architects and photographers busy and, act, uh, and hired during the 30s. HABS surveys are an expensive documentation of the building we have these incredible photographs. It's not just like good old photographs. It is taken with a camera that's a three by five. The, the negative itself is three by five. So it gets this incredible fine granular photographs and then you print them on archival quality paper. And then I have to get on the white gloves and I get a rapidograph and I have to take care of the negatives. So the negatives are big, the prints are big. I do this incredibly comprehensive report. And I did this for five buildings, I got money for five buildings, and then those buildings, those photographs are now in the Library of Congress. Wouldn't Roger Summers laugh, knowing that his work is actually now in the Library of Congress. So this is something we did spend money on, and this is called documentation. So if we have a storm like we had, maybe remember in 2006 when we had that, the like 80 mile an hour winds? I know wh whatever we've done, I have done my HABS duty, so we've been able to document those buildings. So we also could prepared in 2016 a material salvage plan. Are there architectural elements in Druid Heights that we can put into our GGNRA, um, our archives? We have this incredible archives of architectural elements. We've got cannons, we've got cannonballs, um, we have the, uh, the Alcatraz heads, we have all those things. Could we identify some of these pieces for Druid Heights and treat them like museum artifacts? So we looked at that in 2016. And then we also put together, we took about 250 pictures of the site and um, like, like down to the granular. We have, and I spent one January identifying all of these. These are all key to a map. So again, it's documentation, so we know what we have out there. And then oh, we have our GIS specialist got this really cool snazzy um, mapping system. And so we have the entire, it's a little hard to read this map and I apologize. We have this entire area, the, all of Druid Heights completely mapped out. And it's really fuzzy, you can't see it, but it says car, garage, concrete wall. So again, we've documented the whole area to be able to see what on the ground GS, the, we, what we have. So we've done photographs, we've done site stabilization, we've done rat proofing. We've been able to do site work here as well, and we have the HABs. So, um, and again, those are the tools that we use. So when and I said when we talked about the National Register for Historic Places, Alan Watts is sort of captured in philosophy, but Alan Watts himself didn't do the body of the work there. And we had to wrestle with integrity, we had to wrestle with all sorts of issues about condition. So that in a nutshell, did I get through everything? 
Yes, I did. Yay, woohoo, 45 minutes. Um, I want. Um, uh, I wanted to make sure you guys all got a snapshot of how we're taking in and how we're trying to manage this building in these sites, given that we don't know what the future is. We're not sure how this is going to go. We, we've got people, and again, just be mindful that we've got people out there. We have people that are in poor health, and we really we love that everybody's so enthusiastic about the site, but it's not, it's not safe for you guys to go out there. It is a broken leg waiting, waiting to happen. So... I did it, yay. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> so I've got time for questions, and I've got colleagues as well that can help me with questions as well. Yes. Yes. Okay, she asked, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to repeat the questions to make sure everybody can hear. So she asked, how many acres is it? It's about four or five acres, and it's about mm, two or three miles east of Muir Woods. So, and it's as on a slanted slope. It's not in, some of it is valley, some of it is hill, some of it is meadow. It's not like an open area. And how many people approximately About eight. At one point, probably during its heyday documented, might have been 30, 40 people. It waxed and waned tremendously. So a lot of the cottages that literally fell down before we could even get to them were people that, um, you know, people had sort of made up a tiny little little cottage so that they could live in. So, um, so yeah, probably about 30 or 40. Excellent question. Yes. Hi. Yep. Yeah. Thank you for this was great. Um, I'm curious, why do you, why do you not go to the national level newspaper um, That was a conversation that we had with the California. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Um, why did we not go for national significance with Elsa Gidlow for the National Register for Historic Places? Um, she, we did not feel that we'd done some research and we felt like um, we did not feel that her significance had gone past California. Um, I'm trying to think of some other poets that we did research for. We sort of figured out that her, her sphere of influence was certainly to California and the Bay Area. I remember. The cool thing about Druid Heights is that as isolated and as located and quiet as this is, it's only 15 miles from San Francisco. It was only 15 miles from the Haight. So there was a lot of energy back and forth, but the decision was that her sphere of influence was just state and not national. So if that helps answer that. Yes, I don't Once these people pass on, does it all revert to the national Park Excellent question. The question is, once this place, the people who live there pass on, does it all revert to the National Park Service? Sorry, I didn't make that clear before. We already own this property. So in 1970s, if you remember uh, the environmental conflict of Marincello, where they were going to create a 50,000 person or 50,000 unit of apartment housing in the Marin Headlands, uh, the Sierra Club and an enormous amount of people banded together, and it actually helped create GGNRA. The, um, we, the National Park Service, or the federal government at that time, bought out that Marin Headland, the, Mur the Muir Wood expansion. So in 1972, 1973, we bought the property from those people there. They have lifetime estates. They, they are there until they pass. We already own the property. But that's an excellent question. Do more people move in? Or is it no. No more people moving in. We've got water issues. We've got site issues. As I said before, um, Marin County considers that a, one of the most challenging and actually, frankly, one of the most dangerous fire safety areas that we have. So what the place doesn't need is more impact. So yeah. Hi. I remember a few years ago they were going to tear it down because the, the National Park Service, when the last person lived there, mm -hmm. they were going to tear it down. So I'm so pleased that you've recognized it now as so the question was, she remembers that, that in a few years, uh, when the last person leaves, the National Park Service will tear it down. That decision has not been made. So I'm not saying we aren't going to tear it down, and I'm not going to say we are. So we don't know yet what we're doing yet. So remember, we have very, very little money. You want your toilets flushing at Stinson's. You want to make sure everybody is safe on Chrissy Field. These buildings would take up a lot of money, like hundreds. That is very thoughtful. What, okay, anything you people can do to make sure that they can support Druid Heights. We're up at the front, we've got, well, we're still in sort of a public, we're not even public, we're just sort of figuring out what we have. 
There's an email list if you want to sign up so you can figure out, so you can, when we get some information, you'll be, you guys will know. Um, no, if everybody's got a spare billion dollars, that would be terrific. But barring that, and I don't mean to be glib, so remember it's a, it's a long dirt road that we don't own, the state owns that road. So the state, and it washes out, and it's difficult, and it's a little dangerous. So the state owns a road to a place that they don't own the end of. So that's already, we got some issues there. We got some water issues. And then we also have some very serious conditions. So you couldn't get anybody in a wheelchair out there. I'm not sure you could get small children out there currently. And in the future, we're gonna have to really come up, we have to think very long and hard about what we're gonna be able to do out there in the future. Excellent question. I hope I'm well, Kristen, we yeah. did un already take down a number of buildings that were unsafe, yes. non-conforming, uh, people were camping in. So in addition to maintaining the road and keeping on the broom issues um, and reopening the road after slides, we took out a number of buildings that were fire hazards or safety traps. So, so people find their way out there, people that don't really have any association with them. And um, I have uh, um, talked to one of the residents there one Sunday morning, there was bongo drums and somebody had just let themselves into Ranch House, putting on their own little performance program. And I mean, it, we're one knocked over candle away from a really big disaster. So um, people get out there and we can't stop them, but we really would like to uh, determine, we really like to discourage them. Yes. Okay, the question is how interested is the Park Conservancy interested in this? So the Park Conservancy is our sister agency. They're this wonderful organization that supports so much of what we do. I have not, I don't know of any conversations with them. They're involved in other projects. They support us tremendously in a lot of other the projects we do. I don't, I'm not sure that they're involved in this right now. Other questions? Yeah, hi. Yes, um, because of my interest in Druid Heights, I attended the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me try to paraphrase that one. So this gentleman was at the National Trust Conference in San Francisco, National Trust for Historic Preservation Conference. It was just held in San Francisco back in October, early November, and he had talked to some people who said that there might be grants and money available, and that is great. That is great. We're not there yet. It's sort of like planning the wedding and your daughter's not even dating anybody yet. Like, we're really not there yet. But that doesn't mean we couldn't be, but we're not because we've got so many other things trying to figure out on the rest of the park. So, and, but those are the kind of ideas if people still want to work on them and share them. When we get to this planning phase, we will make sure we talk to everybody about it. And we'll make sure, because we don't do anything behind closed doors, we'll make sure we'll check in with everybody. Um, so hold those in your back pocket. Again, anybody falls gets money, good, yes, hi. Oh, excellent question. Okay, so the question was about eligibility, and I'm sorry, I, I'm a geek, so I, I, I apologize if I wasn't clear. So it is eligible. So it's sort of like um, there's getting actually listed on the National Register, and I guess you get the plaque, or just being eligible. Just being eligible is the golden ticket. So that helps. So that is, we're, you know, we could go, probably go ahead and formally list it on the National Register, and we may, but that doesn't get us anything more than what we have now. So the fact now that it is deemed eligible for the National Register, we call it eligibility, that, that's, that we're good, that is, that is something we haven't been able to do in a long, long time. We've never had the money or time to throw towards that, so that means that's good. So there isn't anything more we do. We could get it officially listed, but that doesn't give it any more protection at, in any direction, one way or the other. Yes, hi.
Yes, okay, again, I have to paraphrase that one. Um, so uh, the question was a, a little bit more about the rules and the legislation behind eligibility, and that when we consult, we consult with a wide group of people, and that's an excellent, I'll try to answer it and, and at the same time. So the great thing about these National Historic Preservation Laws is it enforces the Park Service and all the federal agencies, BLM, everybody, to be honest, it enforces us all. It's called the Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. It means we have to check in with everybody. It means we have to check in with our Native American troops. We have to check in with the public. If there's issues or conflict, we have to check in with the Advisory Council for Historic Preservation, which is the big brother in DC that you pull in when people aren't getting along. Um, we, every day, in my division, makes sure that we are compliant with these historic preservation laws. And it means making sure if we, if to, it means taking your time, talking to everybody, and making um, decisions in a larger fashion. Being on the DOE means we're on the hook. We have to be honest. And as I said, when I originally worked with my, my friend at the SHPO's office, when she and I, my colleague, when she and I were working on the pieces, there's a couple of buildings I didn't put on. She's like, um, what about that building? What about that building? I'm like, oh, it's a mess. She goes, doesn't matter. So we added more buildings than I had originally planned on. And that's what keeps us on the ticket. That means we have to make sure. So now these mm, 12, 13 buildings out of 18, that now that they're on the, uh, now that they're DOE eligible, it means I'm on the hook for taking care of them one way or the other. I'm on the hook to making sure that they are, whatever we do is compliant with our National Historic Preservation laws. Yes, hi. Ooh. Okay. Okay, my friend, who's clearly a plant in the group, I didn't ask her to say that, asked what my, um, my idea for 40 or 50 years. I love people to know about this place, but I will tell you, I am very protective of this place. I'm just the latest steward. Mia has been managing this site with Ed and Marilyn for 20 years. I'm just the new kid on the block. And I will also tell you, I am the least outdoorsy person you will ever find. So the fact that I'm that protective of this site means I'm really fond of these people. And as I said, I wasn't around in the 70s. I was back home doing homework. So. I am very protective of this site, and I know so many people come to this site with their enthusiasm, and there's so many great stories to tell, and I really want to know how I can tell the story without getting people out there. So some of the ideas we've talked about is maybe creating a model, maybe doing a, like, you know, like the, the Bay Area model that the, U the, the Army Corps has, like doing a really cool model, or maybe some sort of, well, we're not allowed to have drones in the Park Service, but maybe we could, I don't know, like some drone video that looks at it. I'd love to figure out how to get people to understand and feel good about the history and the creativeness and these wonderful, wonderful, important people without actually getting out there and breaking a leg. So um, I'm thinking of it more in terms of not program or could we get somebody like Green Gulch out there? I'm thinking about just how I could share the interpretation with other people without risking anybody getting out there. If that helps. Okay, next question. Anybody else? Hi, yep. Mm -hmm. Excellent question. So, so uh, this gentleman asked, are there factions within the Park Service who, is it just a funding issue that we're not preserving it? Or are there other questions about, are there some people that are really into it and some people that are, aren't? We're all trying to figure it out. It's sort of a million dollar question in our park. Um, and at the moment, it's not top priority because, because it's not public, because we're not getting people out there. We really focus on the properties that are public, that are where we, we got people falling off a cliffs at Fort Funston because they're walking their dog, and we've got some real other life safety issues where the people are allowed to be out there. 
So it's more a question of priorities. I think we're still trying to figure it out and we just, it hasn't, we haven't been able to have time because we've got all these other th fires that we're putting out. We haven't been able to address this. So I think there's some people who are like, we could make this work. We could somehow make this work. And then there's other people who think, well, maybe we should, I mean, so, so we're still trying to figure it out. And I apologize that I don't have any great perfect answers, but we don't yet. So um, just the fact that we finally, our superintendent finally said, you know what, it's really time to figure out if it's significant. That's a big step for us. We're with the government, we don't work very fast. We've got a lot going on. So just the fact that our superintendent said, you know what, I know we haven't addressed it. Let's at least look at its significance. And that was a big step forward. So if that helps a little bit. Kristen, we yep. also did deal with it in our general management plan, like you had the slide come up. Through 10 years of public involvement, we did adopt in 2014 a general management plan, and Kristen shared the slide that um, the significance of the site would be considered and uh, in some way acknowledged, but the um, natural character would also be a big part of it, and you did call out um, that the road and the infrastructure was a real big issue, so whatever we do in the future has to acknowledge that too. Mm -hmm. And you also showed the planning slide that I really want to emphasize and invite you to sign up on the mailing list for because there's much ahead to continue sharing like we're doing tonight. We didn't want to wait with such a fascinating story. This is our third this is our third show this year because the story and the people are so important that we wanted to um, have evenings like this and we thank the Historical Society for inviting us and the library earlier for bringing um, and inviting people in who live there. So it's, um, there is some direction mm -hmm. and we really wanna make sure we have all of you on our mailing list so that when we take the next steps, you can be part of that too. Mm -hmm. Yes, hi. I'll have me answer that one. So you've actually, so um, the question was when Kristen was talking about our concerns when the wind blows or we have long, hot, dry October and Novembers or we have great big rainstorms last April and we just worry about how vulnerable the, the sites are as well as the people living there are. And um, they do have um, running water and they do have a septic system and they have a one-way road in, but there's none of those available for the public and also the people who are concerned about the natural resources realize that that water is, we don't really have the water rights to the water and the um, sewer is just going into the system. So we're kind of concerned about how we would provide infrastructure out there. It's very fragile. We keep it up for the people that are living there and assist them, but it's all very, very fragile. And it isn't there for the public besides everything that Kristen has mentioned. Um, it's a one-way road. There isn't a way to turn around. And most people do want to go to the bathroom when they get there. And it's very fragile, so um, we want to not only protect the privacy, but we want to protect the health and safety, too. Okay, just a couple more questions, so we'll be cognizant of our hostess. Yes, hi. Hi, my name is Fabrice Florin, and I lived in Druid Heights nice. for several years in the 70s, and it was a transformative experience for me. It, um, it meant a lot to me, it was a sanctuary, and um, I would like to um, encourage you to not just put this thing in a little shrine and nobody can ever experience what we experience, mm -hmm. but to seriously consider making it possible for the public to go and experience what we experience mm -hmm. rather than sequestering it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, even if it's just one building that's mm -hmm. Um, that you put back in place, mm -hmm. um, making it possible for people to take transportation, even if it's public transportation, down there, mm -hmm. and maybe having like a little retreat where mm -hmm. people could um, experience this, because mm -hmm. it changed my life, mm -hmm. and it just makes me really sad mm -hmm. that we're talking about either putting it in a bubble 
or letting it disappear. Mm -hmm. It is a very unique icon mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. a lifestyle that made the Bay Area different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a symbol of what the counterculture meant mm -hmm. and what this bohemian lifestyle was. And there's not a lot of symbols like that around. Mm -hmm. If you let it go or if you make it impossible for the public to go there, you do a disservice mm -hmm. to the entire community. Mm -hmm. And drone videos are not enough. And I'm a video producer. Mm -hmm. I appreciate very much mm -hmm. the value of videos, mm -hmm. but you have to go there to experience what we experience. Mm -hmm. Did everybody hear that? That was a really important yeah. message. Good. Very good. Thank you also um, in June for sharing your experiences. That was a very moving evening when many of you here um, had a chance to hear from Fabrice and others who lived there. Um, so thank you for sharing your stories as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, a couple last questions? No, last question. Last question, last question. Hi. Excellent question. I probably should add that to my slides. So the question was, are we documenting the people who are living there, and can we put it into our archives? So we're actually currently undergoing an oral history program. So we're interviewing people who have lived there, who are still living there now. Those get transcribed, and then they're available to the public. They go into our park archives, and they're in the public domain, and so everybody can hear that. And then I know other people are privately working on videos, but yes, the documentation of the people who lived there and their experiences have, have occurred as well. Okay, thank you guys. I know this is a short term, but we have to be confident of the historical society. Thank you.